That's lovely, Mark. Much. Thank you very much for having us here in Gorey County, Wexford. Yeah. Let me just spin over from the Marble City to see you. Exactly, yeah. It's, I only have to go a couple of metres, so I'm that's, happy enough. That's great. And the sunny southeast living up to a threat every day. Exactly, yeah. Well, I think it's a myth. Uh, I think we only get about one hour extra sunshine in the entire year, so yeah. Plenty of rain today, <laughs> This is though. proof of that today, yeah. <laughs> and you're from Gorey. <clears throat> yep. You grew up here. Yep. Yeah. I was wondering about your, your early days of playing music. Did you start playing the pipes or did you play other instruments first? Um, when I was in primary school, we all had to play the tin whistle. That's just the way it was. And my parents, no one really in my family plays traditional music, so it's, I don't, I'm not sure where the interest comes from. Um, but when I was younger, my parents listened to a lot of Irish music and I used to love it, you know. And when we were getting a few tin whistle lessons, um, the teacher at the time used to do after school tin whistle lessons for more specific tunes as opposed to, you know, down by the side of gardens, that kind of thing, the general stuff. Um, so I started going to a tin whistle lessons after school. Um, and then I remember the first time I saw a set of villain pipes um, because I kept hearing them on the radio and I couldn't, I just, you know, I just didn't know what it was. And I remember the first time I saw it and it just blew me away. So I remember running home to my father and I got the broken leg of a stool and two water bottles under my arm trying to explain to him this instrument that I kept hearing and then I saw it and it looks like this. And uh, he just, he knew what, what it was. So from there on, we kind of, that was, that was how I got into it. Um, so I kind of, I'm envious of today, you know, younger children today, they, they hear of an instrument or they look it up straight away, it's on their phone, and they can just, that's what it is, you know. So I think I, I was weeks, if not months, hearing this thing from time to time. I was like, what is that? You know, you could recognize what a fiddle was or what an accordion was or a harp, piano and everything else. But as you can hear with the pipes, there's so much going on, you're kind of thinking, you know, is that, what is that? Do you know what I mean? Um, so that's, that's, <laughs> I think I got the bug and I've been obsessed with it ever since. Yeah, so you were attracted to the sound of the Exactly, yeah, it really took me and, yeah, that was uh, 21 years ago, I think. <laughs> 21 years ago this year, and that's the, there's an old saying in the piping world, I think it came from Seamus Ennis, that it takes 21 years to become a piper, so I, I don't know, I think I finally crossed the mark this year. <laughs> You've arrived. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, brilliant. The study of the instrument then, I mean, how did you go about finding a teacher? Yeah, so again, when I started, I got the first uh, beginner set, which comprises of the bellows, the bag, and then a more simple chanter, which is the, the main melody pipe. Um, when I started, there wasn't too many around, um, certainly around County Wexford who were playing. So just by chance, a couple of months after I'd started, a pipers club actually started up in Wexford town. I couldn't believe it, you know, great timing. Um, so for about two years, that lasted, and I got the bulk of my tuition uh, down there off two pipers who were from South County Wexford. One is called Ned Wall, and the other man is John McMahon, and they used to travel up every week. Um, at the height of it, I think there was about maybe 15 pipers came along one Tuesday, but uh, over a period of two winters, there was only ever about you know, 10 every week, but I used to love it. I used to absolutely love it. I would record everything on a little old, you know those old cassette recorders, everything. And certain nights other pipers would arrive and they would be playing different sets and different keys. And I just, everything, it was always, there was always something new to find out. And um, I just became, as I say, absolutely obsessed. Um, so then that closed after about two years um, just due to lack of interest, I suppose. You know, I was about the youngest piper in it and there wasn't too many taking it up. Uh, so then, after that, then I used to travel down to a piper once a month, or roughly once a month, uh, a man called Tommy Carney in Dunmore East. And when I was 12, he was 88, and I used to love going down to him. We'd spend about an hour with him, and because of his age, he wasn't really, you know, he couldn't spend too long playing the instrument because it's, oh, it's a physical instrument. But even, even when he stopped and just the stories he had, you know, you really felt a connection to the past from him, you know, and I used to love the stories and the chatting every, every bit as much as just the tuition, you know, but he was a real old school uh, gentleman piper, as we say, and that was fantastic. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, I spent about a year on and off going down to him, and aside from all of that then, um, there is the annual um, tinnos, which is an Irish word for gathering, you know, there's the Willie Clancy Summer School, and different uh, summer schools like that, you would get a few lessons there throughout the year as well. So, uh, yeah, I suppose I had multiple teachers when I was growing up. <laughs> was there more to your young life? Were you uh, yeah. doing other things? Yeah, all loads, yeah. Um, well, don't tell us the bad stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did play a bit of sport, but I actually gave it up young enough. Um, I used to, I was mad, I was absolutely obsessed with hurling when I was younger. Um, but I actually gave that up when I was about 14 or 15 as well, simply because at the time, um, there was a local musician in the town who played flute, was actually playing hurling, got a smack in his hands and he, got, he had to get pins put into his fingers afterwards and he never really, you know, 
played as well after that, in my opinion. Um, so I was kind of thinking, you know, if I stay playing hurling, I could probably go till I'm about maybe, I don't know, 25, 35, whatever it is. But if I stay in music, I can, you know, <laughs> play till I'm 95, you know. And I kind of said, right, um, I'll stop playing hurling because I was afraid to get a, a knock on the hands, you know. And I remember as well when I when I did stop playing, all even you know even today walking down, there's a couple of old teachers who say you know they'd always slag you, you know oh these hands you know always you know going back to that time. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, I was interested in sport, but I think the music interested me more, so that's that's the route I took. So you're a spectator now. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we won't mention the war. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you did. You mentioned that you you would go to summer schools, and uh, so there's a, there's a fair bit of travelling. I, I think yeah. for anyone involved in tradition. Exactly. Music. Yeah. And dedication from parents. Definitely. As well. um, and it's not cheap either because you know you have to go down and spend a week in a hotel somewhere, and as we all know, hotels in Ireland aren't the cheapest either. Um, but even then, and not to sound like an old man, but even then, like for example, a trip to Milton Malby in County Clare was something like maybe five hours, whereas now it's about three and a half. Um, so again, without sounding like an old man, it's before all these, you know, motorways, you know, were available. Even going to Dublin, the, the motorway from Gorey to Dublin now is fantastic, but that wasn't there. So it was actually handier for me at the time, as I say, to go down to Tommy Carney in Dunmore East than it was to go up to Dublin to what is the you know, the Peabody Inn is up there, the headquarters of the Pipers organisation, um, just huge big cultist branches up there. Um, but as I say, the roads, it was easier to get to Dunmore East at the time, whereas now it's the opposite. Uh, we can get up to Dublin in, in 15 minutes, as I say, so, um, so that helps a lot, I suppose. Um, but even that's easier today, the travelling aspect. Um, and as well, my parents were really dedicated. I think they enjoyed it every bit as much as I did, you know. Uh, a week away here or there in the summertime uh, let me off to uh, lessons during the day and it was like a small holiday for them um, because I'm the youngest of six and I don't think they got away too often so <laughs> so that was a good excuse from them for them. You did get to Dublin though? Yeah, September 2007 I got the first lessons with Peter Brown in, in what was then the Conservative Music and Drama in Rat Mines and I was thrilled to get in there and I was there for four years getting lessons with Peter and I was involved with the traditional music ensemble um, and then <laughs> I decided to stay around in, in 2011, I think I done the Masters for a year, uh, so I was there for about five years in total, um, but I really enjoyed it, you know, it, if you were to say that was five years, you'd look back and say it, it felt like one month, it really flew by and there's some great staff and there was great, um, you know, uh, musician friends I met from all over the country, from all over the world, um, and just even being in Dublin and, you know, going around playing in a couple of different um, organizations in Dublin and even then teaching for the Peabody and for cultist organizations when I was up there. Um, I learned loads and it was, it was great, it really was, you know, everyone says they look back at their college years as the best of their, of their life and it really was, it was fantastic, I really enjoyed it, I'd love to do it again. <laughs> yeah. And the, the academic side of it, how did you enjoy that? Every bit as much. Um, when I finished the final year dissertation, I, I remember just, you know, I'd submitted it that Friday in May 2011, I think. And I went back and I was kind of thinking to myself, okay, I put on television, I was thinking, okay, now what, <laughs> you know? So then I, I, that's kind of one of the reasons I said I'd, I'd go and do a year of a, of a master's study. I really enjoyed researching topics like that. Um, so when I finished the master's in 2012, um, I was out in the big bad world for a couple of years, um, playing solo, playing with different organizations, different groups, different dance shows, different orchestras different singers. Um, so it was about a four year period there where I was kind of really non-stop on the go. And in 2016, I was, you know, I really thought to myself, uh, I, <laughs> I don't know, if, I'm not sure if I want to be doing this, you know, when I'm, you know, 70 years of age or whatever it was. So, and I did miss the kind of the research side of it. And I'm really interested in the, you know, the historical aspect of villain piping and everything else. Um, so I decided in 2016 that I'd, you know, chance my arm with a PhD <laughs> and again I was lucky enough to get accepted and I'm, uh, I'm supposed to be finished that but I'm, I'm in the wrapping up stages, it's, I'm, yeah, in the next couple of months I'll, I'll be finished. Um, but the topic is on the use of villain pipes in, you know, in orchestral settings and it looks at the historical relationships of the illum pipes and Western art music and um, I've really enjoyed that but having done that in the, um, in the real life situation, that's really what opened up my eyes to all of this. Um, and there's so much to explore even beyond what I'm looking at. And there's so much new music being composed for Illum Pipes and other genres. It's definitely a, you know, a growing area and 
who knows, maybe I'll do a postdoc on some other <laughs> side of it and see what happens. But yeah, it's, you know, as I say, it's the last couple of years, all the way back to 2007 when I went in first to DIT and then now with the uh, TU Dublin Conservatoire, it's just absolutely flown by. It's, it's scary to think it's, it's over a decade that I've been doing this, you know, so. And in that decade, you mentioned your orchestral research, but you've had a lot of experience playing with orchestras. Yeah, yeah. Talk to yeah. me a little bit about that because it is, I mean, it's daunting for any musician to come in mm. as a soloist to play yeah. with an orchestra. So tell me about your, your first experience of that. Yeah, again, it was because of the DIT Conservatory <laughs> Music and Drama. In final year, there was a, a concerto competition. And to be honest, I didn't really think much about it. I, I don't think I was going to enter it. And Peter Brown encouraged me to enter, enter it. And, you know, I, I, I auditioned playing one of the movements from the Brennan Voyage, which I was obsessed with, even as a child, I remember hearing Nemo Flynn and, and um, the RT Concert Orchestra, that recording of the Brennan Voyage, and I just, that absolutely blew me away. It's actually one of the reasons I studied music in, you know, at the time, just to open up, you know, the doors for Ilm Pipes in other genres. It just works so well. So then, uh, you know, I didn't really expect much, and sure enough, um, I was selected. Uh, there was three altogether selected, and I was one of them. And we couldn't do the Brennan Voyage in 2011 because Liam O'Flynn had just done it on St. Patrick's Night that year, and this was due to be held, our concert was due in, in early April, and I don't think Sean Davy wanted it so close to the other performance. Um, so we had to look for something else at the last minute, and that was Neil Martin's uh, music. And I, before that, I wasn't even aware of Neil Martin. And that, the music, it was from a suite he had composed in 2005 called No Tongue Can Tell, and it was brilliant. And I remember I was so nervous because um, I'd never played with an orchestra before, um, and I'd never played on stage in a national concert hall before. Uh, and I remember just sitting backstage, you know, the last couple of minutes before that, having to come on, I was wearing the tux. We don't really wear a tux every day when you're playing such an instrument, when you're, I should say, when you're wearing such an instrument. <laughs> so I remember just sitting there, and I, you know, just a few times in my life I've been so nervous, and that was one of them. I remember my heart was just pounding, you know. Uh, but it was a real success, it really was, it couldn't have went any better. And David Brophy was conducting that night and he, I think he was impressed because a couple of weeks later, um, uh, Queen Elizabeth II was coming over to Ireland and David Brophy rang me up and said, would you like to play with the uh, RT Symphony Orchestra in the convention center? And to be honest, I thought it was a joke, you know, uh, sure enough it wasn't. And a couple of weeks later, there I was playing with the National Symphony Orchestra. A couple of weeks after that, I was playing in the concert hall again with the, the RT Concert Orchestra. It was, I think it was a night of movie soundtracks and we were doing some of the, um, some of the Braveheart uh, soundtrack, I think. And just, just by chance, and all of a sudden, I found that you know, a couple of times a year, here I was playing with an orchestra, just by chance, and it's continued nearly every, every year since. You know? so, so as I say, that opened up my eyes to what, you know, from the academic side, there was a lot to learn from that. And, you know, as we go further into it, there's more pipers getting that experience because people realise the instrument worked so well with the orchestra. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's essentially, you know, a first cousin of the oboe, you know. Um, but it really works. It's really a fantastic sound. And when you get that experience, there, there isn't anything in the world like it. There's, it's just, you get such a buzz, you know, um, particularly when you're playing those, you know, with the symphony orchestra, a huge, big orchestra you know, the hairs on your neck would stand up. It's just brilliant. There's really, you know, nothing really compares to it. You mentioned playing Neil Martin's music and you've played a few pieces by him. How is the experience of playing works by a composer who's also a piper? It definitely helps um, because one thing I've found over the years of playing in that setting is you might get a piece of music and straight away you're looking at it as like, oh, this doesn't work. And uh, what I found myself I found in the early years I would go and almost rewrite certain bars to make it fit uh, because if I, I often thought if I got back and said that doesn't work they'd say oh maybe we'll just get a different instrument or something um, so you know as you get more experience you realize yeah I probably should have sent them all back to the composer and said that doesn't work change that um, and it's one of the reasons as well I mean the pipes I'm playing at the moment are in the key of D so you've got two octaves um, you know in the D above middle C um, so even trying to play middle C was always an issue and you would almost transpose a whole section of a piece to play on a C channel just to get that one note. Um, so when I got, when Neil's music arrives it's just absolutely perfect. It's just, it's, I love it, <laughs> I can't get enough of it. Um, but that, that definitely helps, it really makes life so much easier. Um, but I do think, like, like I said earlier on, um, because there are more 
more and more composers writing for this instrument on orchestra. I think you know the further you go into it, the easier it gets uh, to, for the composers to obtain knowledge about the instrument, and they just they go and do it. You know, um, so but definitely, yeah, Neil's. I think Neil is even. Uh, he gets a bit brave and he even starts writing in bits of regulator accompaniment as well. Uh, so that's an, another challenge, but yeah, no, he's brilliant. I think maybe it might be time for tune. Great. Um, I could do another tune on this set, or I mentioned other keys, I could do... Yeah, let's, let's have a listen to another set of pipes. Perfect, right. Um, so, let's get rid of the D pipes and put on the B pipes. Right. So tell us what you're going to play and maybe after we might have a chat about this beautiful set of pipes. Now. Yeah, so this is a set of pipes in the key of B, B natural. And I got these in about 2017 um, and they were partly funded, luckily um, partly funded by a music um, network the, um, and the Arts Council from the, uh, what's the grant called again? The, Music capital, yeah, <laughs> um, and I was awarded that in 2012. But uh, anyone who plays pipes, you know, you know, you have to wait a couple of years before you, you get them because every last little bit you see here is being hand carved or hand turned. And uh, so I might play a slow air because I really love slow airs. This is one called Own Row, and I learned this. I kind of half learned it years ago, and I just finished it off recently. But I first heard it. A recording uh, of an old piper called Patter Bro, and I was made aware of the recording um, by Emmett Gill, who's the current archivist in the Peabody Ellen, which is the Ellen Pipers organization. Um, but it's a lovely tune. It's it's a bit it's a bit different to most laments you would hear on, on the pipes. It's uh, just a nice. There's a, there's a great scope for harmony with the regulators. Uh, so I'll give it a try. See what happens.
that's different. gorgeous. <laughs> I, I, I know that a bit. I haven't heard that version of it. It's yeah, really beautiful. It's, it's different. I actually haven't heard that version either, only from this Piper, as I say, mm. Pater Bro. There's a bit more in the second half uh, than you get in most cases. Uh, and I think there is another one. Carlin composed a tune with the same title, which is very different as well. So yeah. um, I just, I really liked it because um, it's in a different key. You know, the drones are always based in the tonic note. In this case, they're B, but you can get a fifth above, as you can hear, there's an extra drone here, um, which sounds great. If you can pick it up. Yeah. It also sounds, uh, sorry, there's a fourth above. It also sounds a fifth above, which offers a nice harmony. And the final one is a major third, which is a great sound. So there's all these lovely uh, possibles. It's minute in comparison to what you could get on a piano or, or a church organ or something, but I mean, it's, it's great fun to play around with different, uh, different harmonic possibility on, on well, these. Well, but instruments. this is what was, as I was listening to it, two things were, were striking me. One, well, my ears were, it, you really have a great time, all those different <laughs> tones, it was so gorgeous. But it, it does, you, you can he, hear why the pipes is, is considered an organ. Exactly, you know? yeah. Uh, so, like, I mean, in, uh, in a lot of cases, there, you know, there's numerous accounts of, especially in the 19th century, of it being referred to as the, the Irish church organ or the, simply the Irish organ. And you can hear it. Uh, it, it is, it's essentially a, a mini organ, you know. Um, but uh, I, I believe a lot of um, rural churches in the 19th century, if they couldn't afford an organ, they would get a piper to play um, hymns. And this instrument is copied off an instrument from about you know, pre-famine times, like most of our, our old great instruments are from pre-famine times and there was a great experimentation that time um, from pipe makers, you know, to add, you know, basically more uh, harmonic possibility and at some point then that sort of, I presume the famine had a lot to do with that, at some point they kind of started to more sta standardise the instruments so there was less possibilities but if you look at some of the photographs of old Ilan Pice museums, you know, there's any amount of different keys here, and I can't imagine what that was like to play. I'd say it was fantastic. Um, uh, but hopefully in the next couple of years, if pipe makers get a bit uh, more brave, they might chance some of that, and I'll certainly be the first to get them. <laughs> but piping itself, is, it, uh, in any culture, is such an old... I mean, it's an instrument that you can trace back mm. so, so far. And, and even though the instrument itself has changed physically, the tradition of piping is very ancient. Definitely so yeah. it, can you date in and piping? Um, I think the instrument started to take its disappearance or this form from about the early 1700s. Um, there is a belief among some that the instrument uh, emerged from an older type of bagpipe, which would be more similar to the Scottish Highland Pipes, for example, but I don't think that's the case. Um, the Archivist Nicholas Carlin has done some great research in the past about the origins of this instrument and he reckons that the bellows here, which is one of the main differences, most likely came in um, to the ports in Ireland via France. It was, a, it was made over there, on a, or it was adopted to an instrument called the Musette de Corps, which is a cork bagpipe. And he compares it to traditional music today, you know, for example, the bazooka came into Ireland in the 1960s and here we are, you know, 50 years later or so and it's well established in the tradition. Um, so the same with the bellows then, he reckons it came in at some point in the early 1700s and then it's, you know, all of a sudden it's really part of the tradition. Um, so I'm not sure if this instrument is entirely new or if it, you know, of course they would have borrowed elements from the other pipes that would have been here before that. Um, but this certainly took over and it was in its heyday in the late 1700s all the way up until the, um, the onset of the famine, as I say. And that's when most of the experimentation and the development of the instrument occurred. And one of the, one of the uh, areas I'm looking at in the PhD is, uh, you know, for example, Western art music, classical music being played on this instrument at that time. So you look at this chanter, for example, it's fully chromatic, but we don't ever use any of those keys generally in traditional music. So if you look at that and you look at some of the old manuscripts of the pipes at that time, they were playing everything and anything. That's just the way it was. Um, so that's why the instrument is the way it is today, uh, really from the period maybe 17, 1760 up until about 1840. I think it's true though of, of all instruments, certainly wind type instruments mm. of that period, because as well, like if you take the flute, 
Yeah. It was the German flute. It was yeah. it was the transverse flute as opposed to this flute. Yeah. And both those flutes were very prevalent in Ireland. Exactly. And yeah. there were there were publications of Irish tunes that people who could so you could you could play so, a bit of Handel and then you could play an Irish tune. So yeah. we've got very clear columns in our head of what you play traditional music and what you play classical exactly, music. But yeah, I don't yeah. think it, th those lines were as clear cut back then. Definitely not. Um, and I think, you know, the further we go on, you know, the further we go on now, it's it's becoming more uh, popular for, you know, traditional musicians to learn Baroque melodies and everything else. And it's great. I really, I, I absolutely love it. Um, and of course, there, like, like everything, there are traditionalists and purists who will say that's not the way it's done, but uh, I don't really listen to them <laughs> uh, but more of it I, and I think that's going to open up more doors the more we the more we go into it as well um, it's one of the great um, it's one of the great drives of being in, in the conservatory as well that you can play around with different you know composers and instrumentalists um, over the years I've done a good bit with David Bremner the organist in Christchurch uh, we were playing some Kubran melodies on the Ellen Pipes and church organ and it just works so well you know as I said earlier on it's essentially the first cousin of an oboe, <laughs> so so there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing more of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and as you mentioned, Kubra, and you mentioned earlier about the French influence, I think that French music, French culture, actually had a big impact on the development in, in music in Ireland. You Definitely, know, even, yeah. Especially with the, with dances and, yep. and if you, if you look at the set dancing and, and the quadrille. Exactly. And, yeah. You know, yeah. so I think we we have we have a view of history that's ever changing. I exactly. Suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, like anything, um, there's a lot of publications from a certain period that will kind of almost make up a false past that this is an, an ancient instrument and it's, it's the most pure Irish instrument. I mean, it is, it is a pure Irish instrument, but it's, uh, it does have its, in my opinion, I'd probably offend a few people, but it does have its origins, uh, or it's definitely heavily influenced by you know, Western art instruments. Um, as I say, all you have to do is look at it. <laughs> and talk to me a little bit about piping in Ireland now and young people. Earlier when we were chatting you mentioned Music Generation. Yep. Tell me what's happening. It seems that the culture is quite healthy. Absolutely. Um, I would say it has never been as healthy and Music Generation has a lot to do with that. The P. Breland, the Ilm Pipers organisation, Cultus Kiltori Aaron, and then just individual pipers around the country that are, that are teaching, you know. Um, so take Music Generation for example. Um, they set up, as far as I remember, 2011 and one of the areas they went into was County Leash and I think prior to that it was maybe two pipers in Leash and now there's anything, I think there could be up to 40 pipers out there, so that's just one example. And then in Gorey, for example, then when I was in secondary school in Gorey, I was the only piper as such and uh, I'm teaching about three or four in that school at the moment, they're all in you know, anywhere between third year right up to sixth year. And I keep saying to them, that must be you know, great fun having you know, another piper in the school. <laughs> you know, I think they, they must think I'm crazy. I, you know, as I say, I was too obsessed, but I mean, you know, imagine going up and talking to your friend in school about Ilum Pipes. It definitely didn't happen in my day, but as I say, there's, there's four of them in that school now, so it's definitely, you know, it's definitely taking off. Um, and I think um, because there's more makers of the instrument, there's a great... Um, there's been a great explosion of interest in manufacturing the instrument in the last decade and there's you know just top makers turning up all over the world um, and I think that definitely helps because you know as I mentioned every last bit of this is handmade and you have to wait so long to get a you know top quality instrument uh, so with more makers it reduces the waiting list and there's more pipers able to get good instruments and it, yeah it's kind of like this religion that's spreading you know <laughs> Um, but yeah, cult, so maybe. Exactly, cult. <laughs> cult, that's a better word, definitely. There's a lovely camaraderie <laughs> amongst pipers, so that's my experience. There's a, a brilliant photograph that I saw of uh, a gaggle of pipers mm, with yeah. our colleague yeah. Gary O'Farrell, yeah, yeah, yeah. the lone harper. <laughs> and, it, and, and there's such friendship and joy coming yeah, out of yeah, that, yeah. that picture. Exactly. It must be wonderful, that's, is it? Yeah, that was all of us again in Leash. Uh, they had uh, a tinnel, which is the Irish word for gathering, and they have in Leash now they have an annual pipe, pipes and harp tinnel. Uh, as the two kind of old uh, historic instruments and Anne-Marie, God love her, she ended up at a, a bar full of pipers that night and we were all just sitting around talking about reeds and different materials, uh, different styles um, and yeah she just found herself in the middle of it but she loved it. Great, she loved that woman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now you have joined the staff at the conservatoire. 
It's, we're delighted to have yeah, you. Tell uh, us about your I'm new role. Absolutely thrilled to be involved. I really am. For the, for the first part of this year, of course, it's all been online, but even that's been great. It's been great to be part of the teaching staff, to be involved with such a prestigious organisation, and I just cannot wait to get back and see the new campus. I've, I've briefly had a, a, a look around um, with the concert hall and the new, you know, the whole setup. It's absolutely stunning. So, yeah, I can't wait to brainwash a couple more pipers in the next couple of years, um, and just to mix, just to mix with other, not just other musicians, but other art forms and the, in the campus. It's absolutely fantastic. It really is. I'm really envious. I'd love to be a student there. You know, so who knows? Maybe I might start another course myself. <laughs> and for any young person who might be watching and considering a career, especially if they if they play traditional music mm. and they're considering a career in music, any advice? Yeah, um, keep your views open and basically say yes to everything uh, because it's, it's like what I said earlier on, just by chance I went and played the, the concerto competition or Peter Brown said go and try it and I tried it and all of a sudden I find myself neck deep in, in other genres and I, I think when you're in college and again it's hindsight is easier but I would always, always encourage people to you know just go and do it, go and try it. You've nothing to lose and you've everything to gain. Um, I've certainly found that in my case. Um, and I, I mean, it does open up more doors as well. Uh, before I became part of the staff, I mean, I'd done the four years plus the year of a master's. And as I say, the next couple of years, it just opened up so many doors through contacts, through the skills you develop when you're in the college. Um, and you definitely, it's just, it's fantastic. You know, the life of a musician, I mean, I, I don't know if I'd ever be suited to an office job or anything like that. Um, so I definitely, you know, urge students if they, if they want to get into it, not to be afraid because, you know, there's always going to be something for them, you know, um, if, if, if that's anything to go by. <laughs> you might play us something else before yeah, we go. perfect. Have you another set of pipes? I do, yeah. Great. <laughs> uh, the How next many sets of pipes do you have? I have too many. Um, <laughs> one of the... One of the things I've tried to do in the last couple of years is get a set in every single key that so, you know, when a gig pops up and there's, oh, we want a little piper to play in this key or that key that you can say yes. Um, but it's just, it's like, I suppose if someone plays golf, they want different types of golf clubs and everything else. As I say, I'm just so obsessed with it that I try to get different instruments. So I have them all except a set of villain pipes in the key of C sharp. And in August, I'll hopefully have the set in the key of C sharp. <laughs> uh, so the next set, let's put these over here. Okay, so this is the a B flat set, and these are probably one of the rarest in the Pipe family, simply because they're so big and awkward. Um, not many makers tend to make them; they're a troublesome instrument. This one is copied off an instrument that is actually in a museum in um, in Australia, and it was made by a man called Jeff Wolf, who specialises in you know uh, older design. Um, but there's a lovely mellow tone off it. Um, I never really got a chance to play these. In, in your usual settings, they're too big, they're too quiet, um, but it's one of the instruments I use, for example, playing with David Bremner on, on the organ. Uh, so it's in B-flat, and I'll play a, mm, a jig called Paddy Fahey's. Great. Now, before we uh, depart, uh, you were you were mentioning that you uh, haven't been off the campus, but yeah. you're going to be, and you'll be on that fine motorway. So I brought you the presents <laughs> for your car. Oh, thanks very much. Um, there you ah, go. Geez. <laughs> <laughs> Safe journey Brilliant. up the cats. <laughs> Can't wait to put that on. Thank you very much. No problem.
Mark, uh, absolute pleasure. Thank you so oh, much. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's, I, as I say, I could talk about these all day. Um, so let's go for round two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, cheers. Well done, Are you sure you're going to be? You're not going to be missing that now.